Hello, everybody. My name is Luke Stapley. I am the marketing director at Coco's, and we are at a Hyper Game Hyper Games Conference, and we're at the Reach the Top with the Best Marketing Speakers. Uh, we would like to introduce all of them, and we hope you have a wonderful time listening to what they had to say. I'll go ahead and I'll start from the top left. We have a Vlad. Uh, I'm going to try to get this right. Vladislav Ladisvensky. Quite good, huh? <laughs> or just Vlad? Yeah, Vlad would be great. Uh, he yeah. is the head of growth at Sunday. Um, we also have Uruj Iqbal, who is the growth and partnership manager at Playdo. Uh, and we also have Yolanda Huang from. Uh, she's a client growth at Native X. So it's great to have uh, you guys all here. Could you give a little bit more of an introduction to about yourselves, uh, starting with Vlad? Yeah, sure. So as you mentioned, so I'm the head of growth at Sunday. We are a hyper casual games developer and also publisher based in Hamburg, or Germany. And um, yeah, I'm responsible basically for all the UA and monetization activities on our side. So thanks for having me. Oh, thanks for, you for coming. Ruz, can you uh, give us a little bit of uh, information about yourself? Uh, sure. Uh, I'm Ruz, and I'm the growth and partnership manager at Playdew. Uh, we work across all the platforms, and I'm responsible for the marketing and uh, you know business development and partnerships. And I, I think I'll pass it on to our next guest. So, hello everybody. Very nice to meet you. This is Yolanda. I'm working for NativeX. So we are a, a global marketing agency having over 200 employees across 17 offices. So I'm personally based in Germany here, taking care of. Uh, Flight grows in mainly in EMEA region. Great. So let's uh, let's kind of get into what got you into the marketing of casual and hyper casual games because we not only do we talk a lot about hyper casual games, but there's also a couple of casual or a little bit more uh, formatted hyper casual games. Uh, but I mean, like that. What, what got you into this, especially with Sunday? Yeah, so honestly, for me, it was, I think, the fast pace. I think there's mm. no other game genre where within a year you would have tested so many different types of games, and each of them has their own individual uh, KPIs, challenges, and things that you need to take into consideration, and sometimes also learn from scratch, basically, like what do you need to look for. Um, so that was the main reason for me to join Sunday, I would say. Well, that's great. Uh, uh, and now, Ruj, you, you've been doing both hyper casual and uh, casual games. So what got you into the uh, into this? Uh, so like gaming has always been like a very interesting field for me. I wanted to get into it. And uh, especially if you look at hyper casual games, I think it's a real test for marketers because the time period between actually making the product and shipping it and to the product at life, it's really short. So you have to make very quick decisions and, you know, uh, have fast thinking processes and even your team has to act quite fast if you want to be, to make a successful title. So, you know, this is something that uh, I think is a test of my skills also and uh, gives me a great chance of learning. And is this something a little bit, uh, I know uh, both Vlad and Yolanda are in Germany, uh, but you're in Pakistan. I mean, is this something a little bit, uh, I know with like Germany, we've had many companies who have been doing this for many, many years. Pakistan is probably one of the newer groups that are starting to get into the industry. Is is having that new opportunity helping or is it something that is seen as a, a hindrance for you? Um, as a marketer, I think, uh, yeah, there, there could be problems because people are still trying to understand the industry. It's still emerging, uh, you know, gaining experience. But otherwise, I think the developers are doing good work and Pakistan is predominantly a hyper casual and mobile market. So like things are improving and, you know, more people are coming into the industry. Yeah, I'm seeing that Pakistan is starting to grow very well. And I think a lot of people are excited to see where it goes. Uh, Yolanda, I, I, you're working with Native X. I mean, is this uh, kind of what you've been doing for a while? I, I forever. Know, <laughs> forever. No, but um, I kind of like, um, 
I had a long history in the marketing for games, yeah, not um, limited to casual, hyper casual games. Mm. So uh, 14 years ago, when I graduated from uh, with an engineering degree, somehow I decided to join a game company. But back then, it's like MMORPG and all those stuff. Um, I was doing marketing. It's like really old school ways, booking out the banners of this gaming website and forum and all those kind of things. Um, and then I changed to the second job, which was the DSP. It was eye opening for me to know that everything could be trackable and I'm really in love with it. And ever since then, it's always like marketing and games. And, you know, it's just ups and downs with the industry. When casual, hyper casual become the core that we are talking about, then it's mostly we are, um, we, we, we do everything around the, the general. Yeah. I, I... Uh, as someone else who has been in the industry for a long time, I mean, it is interesting to see the growth that is coming out of these new kind of genres like hyper casual games. I mean, I know for both you, Vlad, and Aruj, you probably you haven't been in the uh, sector for maybe less than four or five years. I mean, how? What are some of the challenges that you think marketers need to prepare uh, when they're just starting as someone who's kind of already kind of setting yourselves in? Uh, the hyper casual space. I'll ask Rouge first. Uh, yes. So it, it also depends that as a marketer, you know, you know, since like uh, if we look at our market, the industry is really new, and even the new people coming into the industry, uh, you need to know games. Like if you don't know, like it becomes really tough for you, and you know, you also need need to track so many things, and it's it's a kind of a hectic job uh, if you if you don't know what what you are doing. <laughs> You know, there's a lot of things involved. You start from ASO ads and, you know, reviews and all the analytics data. All, all of these things have to be managed. And especially if you are working for smaller studios, then, you know, you don't have such big teams. So it also comes down to like two or three people who have to manage all of this stuff. So that, that's quite challenging. And you also need to play a lot of games and know the market trends and i have seen a lot of people who who do get into marketing or even the gaming industry without uh knowing anything about games or they don't even like to play them and it actually creates a lot of trouble for them yeah you probably are not going to be there for a very long time uh vlad are you, is that something that you're seeing as well in your space yeah i definitely agree like if you look at the whole industry as well for the hyper casual games i think it became more competitive so it's not enough anymore to just have this one fun looking game where you reach a low cpi on facebook and everyone will download it and you get rich afterwards in a month after one day of playtime. but you really need to have a solid present a solid game experience to the user and then to uh, keep him in the game for longer than just one or three days you really want to give him something to play and then also if you look at as overall i think the whole market um, the biggest networks are now more self-optimized. They have their own dashboards. They improve their dashboards and the API, source bidding, and etc. So you really need to, as a marketer, you really need to know your job and what you're doing to get to succeed there. Because the networks are giving you more opportunity to, to do it yourself. Um, no. Yeah. You have anything else uh, to add, Yolanda? Yes, yes. So I completely agree with what Ruj and the uh, Black just mentioned. Know the game. Um, for just from the agency perspective, we would like to add a little bit into it, which is know the traffic, know how we really push the game out. Because if the game is good, of course, um, it attracts people organically. But um, we, it's, uh, I, I mean, we, we, we should always leverage the, the, the full power, the full potential of um, uh, UA channels as well, how to reach to our audience. So as an agency, what we are doing is that we need to always keep up with the trend. Um, with all the new platforms coming out, let's say uh, back three years ago, 2019, I used to have these partners uh, located in Finland. And TikTok was like a really new thing back then. Yeah, Imagine now even like maybe it's still 20, 30% of the, the market thinks that TikTok is a new thing. But back then it's really like they just launched money, uh, commercialization and those things. So hyper casual companies back then used to test with Facebook with other video ad networks. But this uh, partner, they decided, okay, they could do it. And user acquisition cost back then was just a few cents per download in US and it easily boosted everything up to the top 10 under US gaming chart. 
So those are the things that we keep up with, we share with the clients, what is new, uh, what is in the market now that uh, has the benefit because every platform, when they start commercialization, they want to give all the benefits out to attract people to come in to, 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 to try out all the features. So those are the things we, you know, we assist um, the developers um, um, together to engage the market. Yeah, I, I know that, uh, Vlad, you guys have something called Sundash, right? Yeah. And it's doing uh, kind of the same thing, right? Well, not exactly. Sundash is helping the publishers to basically see their KPIs more easily, I would say. So it's like, mm. we, we, of course, still, it's, it's not like we are offering by Sundash a network. It's just, uh, it's, it's more of a dashboard which helps them to evaluate the performance of their games once we are testing them. Mm. Yeah, and that's, that's probably where a lot of places you need to go now is you'll need to do a lot of these kind of testing. I, I know uh, that, you know, when you can you explain actually a little bit about what this kind of testing is all about, like this A-B testing and how this is helping you with uh, the marketing of the game? Um, yeah, for sure. I mean, once you have an idea of a game and you definitely need to test it in the market. So you need to figure out, is the concept itself interesting for the for the audience, then does it keep them interested in, inside, inside the game? So are the game KPIs actually looking good and hitting your benchmarks? And you need to find out if the game is scalable. So if it will, if it has a good chance to become a hit game. And once those three things are basically approved by your test uh, approach, um, then you start to dig deeper into data and then you start to improve the game by A-B testing certain features, certain uh, placements for ads. Um, to improve those KPIs before you basically soft launch, I would say. And, do, and does this help with your A-B testing of your, of your marketing? Because I've, I have found some very interesting things about uh, the marketing. For example, uh, Miniclip uh, had a very interesting uh, uh, marketing idea where they had a video of a person playing the game on the pool table. And uh, it was with a yellow pool table and it did very poorly. But when they changed the pool table to like a green or blue, it became one of their highest selling marketing opportunities. Is this also something that you guys are doing as well? Yeah, absolutely. That's like more of the creative testing approach. That's for sure. So there you test all kinds of different variations. So one you found, once you found the basis, basic idea of like, let's say, a simple gameplay for your game, where the user has easy time to understand it and is also engaged with the um, with the creative, then you can also ideate. And then you start to look, okay, are the colors right? Can we have a fail or a win state? So all kinds of things. So you basically build the metrics where you test all different variations of the creative. That's definitely what we do. And I think that's also hopefully the industry standard. <laughs> I, yeah, I would hope so. Too. Is it your standard as well as Rouge? Uh, well, right right now we're not uh, specifically working in that kind of genre, but uh, yes, definitely if you uh, want to publish a mobile game, we definitely do A-B testing. It's it's very necessary at that point because you, you have to test, test different creatives and which works the best for you. Also, uh, when you want to, you know, get the lower CPIs, then it, it becomes like a major concern. Uh, also, like not just with the ad creatives, like A-B testing can also be done within the games. Uh, you know, like the be best thing about games is that, you know, the marketing starts actually with, with the game design the, when, when you start making the game. So there are a lot of uh, things that can be A-B tested even within the game and that uh, help you drive high, high, higher revenues and more retention from the players. Mm. Yeah, Yolanda, you, you, you've, uh, I'm sorry, you have something to say, lad? No, it wasn't me. No, no, no. Okay, I'm sorry. I heard something. Uh, Yolanda, you, you, you've, you've seen uh, I, a lot of people who have built like tons of uh, these kinds of uh, marketing. Uh, oh, I keep forgetting the name now. Uh, but these these creatives, and you, you probably like. Is there something that people need to learn or understand that you think would be recommended for people who want to improve upon their marketing? Yeah, definitely. So um, we creatives is kind of like our daily life. Yeah, we deal with it every day. Um, <clears throat> so uh, just as you mentioned, the, the color of the pool table, it makes a difference. Um, but before, I mean, where to start with, right? Some, some, sometimes my client asks me, OK, so what should I test? Should I test green versus yellow or what? So that depends on your audience. So let's say, for example, the, 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 the example just now, uh, Blue and green works better than yellow for 
a pool a table audience, the mainly male audience. And we do have other clients that we work together on creative solutions. The, 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 the game is more like a casual cute style. So the main ta uh, targeting audience is uh, female. And then purple and pink works much better than the other colors. We already know from the beginning, this is already a proven fact. So that's one, we do have a, do, we do have a starting point where to start test. Number two would be, I would say, uh, try to break down the gameplay into elements that can be can be iterated upon, depending on uh, the user engagement with it. Yeah. So mm. don't A/B test with too many elements. So don't A/B test with too many elements at once because uh, it will make the analysis super hard, like uh, both compl right. uh, complex and inaccurate. Yeah, so I, so like what you're saying is like if you have one type of gameplay uh, style or something you do in the game, don't have multiple ideas of all of it at once. Try to stick to just this one gameplay set that That's people right. can, all that I understand it. Oh, this is fun, and then try to implement multiple uh, creatives from that. Hmm. That's very good. Do you feel I, I found that it's very interesting because I have seen a lot of different types of uh, creatives that have been pushed out lately. I've seen some that are cartoons. Uh, I've seen some live action uh, role playing uh, with some of the Eastern European kind of companies. I've seen a lot of uh, celebrities. I, I'm starting to see some celebrity uh, promotions. Uh, also finding humor. A lot of them love to have the humor or they like to have some kind of uh, way uh, having the player try to actually try to actively finish that action. Have you found that these are probably the best things to do uh, as a marketer? Have you found that there's new styles that are really making wins happen, uh, uh, Rouge? Uh, so like previously, uh, you know, there, there was a trend of just showing the ga gameplay. But right now, I, th I think we, I have also seen celebrity endorsements in that. So the, I think they, they are uh, make, making it much easier. That's why they're using they Also, there has been a trend of ads where they, especially in the puzzle games or uh, things like that, where they, uh, uh, they uh, what, what I, what was the word, sorry. Uh, where they intentionally actually make you fail in the ad. So like the users actually get frustrated why they are doing it wrong and want to download the game. So that's also like a psychology being used in the ads a lot these days. Uh, so I think these uh, these two things are mainly more popular um, in today's trends. But eventually, obviously, these trends will also change over time. So uh, you know, we need to keep a track on like how the CPIs are converting and how much uh, clicks we are getting on these ads. Uh, but definitely, there has been a rise with the uh, with the players actually playing the game uh, and uh, these uh, new uh, new style of showing the gameplay and failing at it. These, these has been rising these days. Vlad, do you have any, uh, any other things you want to say? Yes, I think what is important to keep in mind is where your ads are being shown and what is the audience there. So whatever works on an SDK network, so within a game, doesn't necessarily work on a social placement like TikTok. Um, so if, if you do social, then you, you it might be worth trying like real actors and you have to, you have to test basically what works better for you. But mm. if the style of the platform is more engaging, more about fun, more about memes, then it's good to fit the style. And if you are scaling, let's say, on SDK networks, then we still see that the gameplay works the best. Because, and also there, you have to keep in mind, like, what are your sources? Where are you actually yeah. getting shown? Because then if someone plays a racing game and then you do a racing game style of creative, the chances are higher that you're going to have higher conversion rate, basically. Mm. Yolanda, do you have anything to add? <laughs> yeah, to be honest, it's such a huge topic. Um, I just had earlier in the morning a, a solo speech about it, and I couldn't squeeze all the tips in for uh, in the in the half an hour. Uh, but just to add on to uh, what Flat just mentioned, uh, he mentioned about where your ad is shown and who your ad is showing to, right? And um, uh, what I could add into it is, for example, um, talking about the content style. Let's say um, uh, either you mentioned humor, you mentioned cartoon. Um, what we are seeing is that uh, live action sitcoms uh, is definitely in the trend, especially on the social platforms. And then um, uh, voiceover, like broadcasting, mm -hmm. 
it's also a cheaper way, like I mean, more affordable way of how you add a human touch into um, your creatives to give it a higher CTR and CDRs. Yeah, I have been seeing that a lot of these uh, commercials or these uh, creatives that I've seen lately that were doing okay have now come back again with a uh, kind of a voiceover behind it. Or I've seen uh, that was a big hit a while ago was uh, people actually playing a game and then talking about what actions are going on during exactly, the game. Exactly, exactly. Those are the types that's really driving performance. Mm. So, well, then let's talk about because uh, Aruj, you've been, uh, no, I'll talk to Vlad first. I mean, we've talked about, okay, we have creatives. That's one thing. I mean, what are the, like, the big main things that as a marketer you should be looking towards? Uh, to get like the most bang for your buck for uh, advertising your game. We already talked about, of course, advertisements, but is there anything else? <laughs> I mean, the, the formula is simple. So you, you have your CPI and you have your IPM and then that's your eCPM in the end of the networks. And that's where you compete. So if we talked about how you increase your IPM by having better creatives, having better ASO basically, um, hmm. Then you also need to improve the game, as we said. So your product has to uh, deliver decent quality and decent LTV. So you have a possibility to basically bid higher and get the higher ECPM to be placed in the high value placements by the networks. Yeah, ASO is actually something I, uh, unfortunately, we, we were going to have uh, somebody from Lab Cave Games, uh, Jeanette Delazio, come, but she didn't come. Uh, and I've talked with Lab Cave Games multiple times about, uh, and they've had like amazing uh, presentations talking about the power of ASO, where just doing uh, a lot of A/B testing, you can grow 100, 200 percent in your downloads. Uh, how important is ASO, Aruj? Uh, do do you guys work on that very constantly, as much as creatives? Um, yes, I, AS, I, uh, if we say like ads are not the only way to drive audience to your games, like AS will help us a lot, like, you know, uh, choosing the right keywords, going with the trends and uh, looking at who your competitors are. Uh, also, uh, like, I, I think there's a misconception in the developer community, at least what I have seen uh, among like the people here that uh, ASO only consists of keywords. It, it doesn't. You know, you have to do the A-B testing with the creatives. And like personally, uh, I, I, I tested some A-B creatives and we were able to drive our downloads by 200 percent just by testing different creatives. Uh, so like uh, it definitely helps. And uh, even after that, the quality of your game also matters. Uh, so, you know, even if you have like a very good looking store page, all the keywords are right, but you know, your app is not working and it keeps on crashing or there are a lot of bugs and you, you're going to get a lot of bad reviews. Or even if you make like wonderful ads and uh, you know, your gameplay is not actually like like that. And you recently, I, I have seen a lot of reviews where people come and say like, your ads are fake, your games has too many ads. That, so like uh, these complaints actually add up and then uh, you know drive your app quality lower. You start getting bad reviews and then, uh, then your CPIs are automatically going to get higher and your creatives will not work. But, uh, but right. it's not the fault of marketing at that point. It's, it's the fault in your product that you need to correct. Yeah, that, that's, a, that's something that we'll probably talk a little bit in a, another talk. <laughs> we'll be talking a little bit about how, keeping the engagement going, which I think is, a, is a, not as much of an issue for the marketer, but definitely the next stage. I mean, as a marketer myself, it's always our, our idea is that we're supposed to make the, the front of the house look beautiful and wonderful and people will go ooh and on. Ah, they want to come in and see what's going on inside. And then after that, it's, it's the rest of the, <laughs> you want to make sure that. <laughs> yeah, you're that definitely that works as, uh, you know, that definitely works in the initial stages, as long as no, no one knows what's inside the house. Once the things inside the house come to the front, uh, <laughs> there's a lot, lot more oh, yeah. of things that you have to deal uh, with. Oh yeah, and, that, and that's a huge, that's another problem. I mean, but Yolanda, I mean, is there anything else? We've just talked about ASO and we also talked about creatives. I mean, is there anything else that a lot of marketers are missing that they should start to be focusing on? Well, I mean, ASO is not really our business focus, um, <clears throat> but it is definitely, you know, ASO and paid UA definitely benefit from each other. They can be very complimentary. Uh, because in the end, uh, if we are, you know, running advertising for advertisement for, for, for the clients uh, from the social medias, in the end, we are driving impressions and clicks 
right? One specific thing is that um, uh, when they are driven to the landing page, for example, you want to you don't want them to drop off there. We would like to improve the CDR as, as much as possible, in a sense. And, 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 and can you give us an example of that? Example of dropping off on the landing page. Like, yeah, having, I mean, a, having a good. <laughs> okay, I can throw in an example, but it's from quite a few years ago when I was heading the UA of uh, a product by myself. So what happens mm -hmm. is that uh, that was already back in 2015, 14, around that area. Um, so we do have this um, um, in-house protocols, kind of like SOPs, what, how we are doing the A-B testing with the landing page, how we are doing the ASOs, and how do we observe um, the increment of the page, uh, the, the the conversion rate itself, by comparing clicks driven in and uh, 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 conversions from different platforms to improve that constantly. Mm. Oh, I see. Okay, yeah. So you uh, probably yeah. I mean, going back into the ASO kind of idea, because I know a lot of these uh, are going to be the landing page is probably going to be uh, their app store. So. Oh, that's right. Yes, yes. It's it's just specific. Specifically but, but, adding that in, into the topic as well. Yeah, but also, yeah, remember, we also have websites. I mean, we, we're, that is one thing that we're that's getting big is, uh, and I talk to a lot of developers now, is HTML5 is becoming a big thing. And there are a lot of hyper-casual HTML5 games coming out soon. So uh, something for people to look, not for us marketers to look forward to, but something for some of you BD people. Um, we can go back to Vlad. Vlad, I mean, we, I'm trying to think of what we could ask next. I'm, uh, by the way, if anybody in the audience has any questions, go ahead and leave the uh, questions there, and hopefully we'll have somebody uh, will send these questions to us, and uh, we'll have it answered. Um, but going back to, to ASO, uh, um, so addition, additional to the ASO topic, I think also it works the other way around. So if you, you need to you set up a certain expectations by your creators, so you need to fulfill them by your by your presence in the store. So you cannot have like a cinematic trailer with the highest CTR rate. But then your conversion rate will not fulfill it, so you still end up with a low IPM. That, that's the key here. So, yeah, I, I think uh, for a lot of marketers, that's going to be the big key. Is yes, getting them, getting them to to say, hey, this is interesting. Let me go to the store. That's part one. And then part two is, okay, the store looks awesome. This looks like a game yes. I want. I'm going to download it. That's part two. And then, and so, I mean, that's going to be the big question. Is is you're, you're right? The day zero. Is what's your day zeros compared to your and how many people are actually coming to the the store? And I think that's a big uh, a big question. Is that something that you you're always kind of focusing on, Vlad? That's the thing that you're dreading every morning, looking at those percentages. <laughs> you know the percentages for sure, the retention rate. Um, but yeah, like when it comes to ASO, we mainly focus. Like it depends on the country. Like you know that there are statistics. Like in some countries, people are more reading the text, and the other countries they are looking at the screenshots, and in others they look at the uh, ratings, but overall, I think for us, it's more important that the screenshots, the logos are fitting the style of the creatives. Also with the custom product pages of, of iOS, where you can now say exactly like which product, which creative will lead to which page. And um, so this is something interesting for HyperCasual. I think when it comes to keywords, it's a bit trickier because also when you do the A-B test in the store, you see the conversion rate improvement, but you not necessarily see the keywords rate improvement. Therefore, you need other tools and other approaches, basically, how to tackle keyword optimization. And so, oh, well, well tools, that's uh, something that we could all talk a little bit about. Like, what are some of the tools that you guys are using that are not in-house? Because I know a couple of places have their own in-house items. Yolanda, do you guys have any that you use that help that uh, other marketers could uh, use as well? We do. <laughs> we do. So uh, we do have this uh, platform called XMP. It actually started off uh, as an in-house platform to increase our own efficiency because we are connected with so many uh, uh, platforms. We can't really be doing like uh, the whole team can't really be logging into into ten different ones on, uh, on a single day and try to optimize things. So we have this in-house tool um, that all the creators' campaigns, all the data are being fed in all at one place. Visualization is available at one place, um, and uh, the beauty is that uh, of course, if you have everything at one place, you can have those. Uh, AI powered optimizations, you can have it automated. And then our team can basically spend more time in, in you know delivering the creatives because that's the real human touch behind. We need to keep up with the with the with the uh, market. So eventually our clients say, okay, can we 
you know, there are two scenarios why they, why they usually like this. One is that um, because there are so many local small platforms and new ones, that the in-house team might not be able to just connect right away with their internal BI. So they could actually link the information, use our, our, our platform for a while until they're convinced to add this to their in-house platform. Or it could be smaller teams. Um, they can just pay a monthly subscription to use the same uh, as what we are using. Hmm. Hmm. Is, is there any tools, Arouge, that you guys are using that you're OK to share with everybody? Uh, you mean I tools to... of, tools of, oh, sorry. <laughs> no, no, go, go ahead. It's OK. No, 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 I, 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 yeah, I misheard the question. <laughs> uh, so yeah, there have been different tools that I've used like uh, over my career. So obviously for ASO, obviously most popular, I think people use are like Sensor Tower and Appany. I think that they're the pretty basic. Everyone knows them. And then for uh, maybe the game analytics, like even the app stores offer you a good uh, fair amount of analytics as a, as a starting way uh, to analyze your you know retention rates and uh, conversion rates. So like even the store data can help you a lot. Uh, and if you go want to further dive dive into that, then obviously there are, there is you know the engines offer their own analytics, like Unity offer their own analytics, and then there is Firebase and Google Analytics. Like you can go as deeper as you want to. So, and there are a lot of, uh, you know, agencies available who, who can help you with that. And, uh, you know, there are also free tools available if you, if you like, don't have much budget, but, uh, you know, just, just Google them, you will find a lot of names. Hmm. Oh, well, Vlad, you, you guys probably have some great tools as well, right? Yeah, like, as, as a part of Apply Group, we are kind of fortunate that we have quite a big tech stack behind us. So. We do have our own MMP just track and where every data comes together from monetization sites, from the stores, from the game performance, and also from the UA. And um, so we don't need to rely a lot of third party tools, to be honest. And also, like as you said, we have Sundash that we built to uh, extract some data from the stores and so on. And also on the other side, we have our own in-house network. So we are really like focusing. We believe that if you need a certain tool over a long period of time, it makes sense to invest the time and then produce, build it yourself rather than to outsource it and pay for the external partner. Yeah, that's, uh, that's, uh, that was something I found when I was doing research on your company. I think Sunday had some very interesting, uh, very yeah. interesting tools that they were given out uh, for their developers. It was, seemed to be a very interesting uh, aspect other than all the, hum the human love for each other uh, in, in, in your promotional videos. <laughs> a lot of uh, love for each other. Um, which I found, uh, but it is interesting that you guys, we, we've talked about ASO and we've talked about, uh, creatives. I, I did, nobody talked about social media and that is something I'm very big into, uh, with our company because we have, our products are free. So there's not really a lot of opportunities to advertise for it. So a lot of social media is how we, uh, promote our properties. I mean, do you feel especially with hyper casual games, do you feel that it's necessary to have social media or do you think that maybe having your company and having kind of like, we know like Voodoo or other ones that. <laughs> Sorry about that. But you know, we have Voodoo and we have some other companies that are able to kind of say, hey, these are our games. You should try to play them. Is that something that you guys are also looking into like that, Vlad? It depends on the goal. I mean, it does definitely make sense to have uh, social media channels uh, for whatever purpose, like it might be PR, it might be for hiring. Um, but when it comes to actually buying users, that's a bit of a different topic. So like, um, you need to actively run the channels if you just want to do it organically, basically. And then you need someone who is like taking care of like, what does the user want to see? And then you build the brand. Um, but when it comes to just literally UA, so from my perspective, it's more about, it's a great opportunity to test things because you have such a great audience and great targeting. But afterwards, mm. I still see the better SDK on SDK networks, to be honest. Mm. Uh, is that the same thing with you, Arush? I mean, I, I, I've seen some, uh, you've used it a little bit for some of your games. Um, I, I would agree with Vlad here, uh, like especially in the hyper casual genre, like yes, you can make your social media presence, but most of the user acquisition would come through ads rather than people would prefer to follow a AAA game rather than a hyper casual game on social media. 
so yes but it's a digital uh, digital age so it definitely makes sense to have some kind of presence on social media especially if you are aiming uh, to be a brand in the longer term mm. uh, uh, so yeah like you know uh, everyone is on the internet so you should also have a presence on the internet that that, that that's like the main line but uh, like hyper casual conversion is not mainly driven by social media presence it's mostly through, through your career news Yo, Andy, you look like you're you're bored and want to get to the next question. <laughs> so. oh, no, 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 absolutely not. No, I'm <laughs> eagerly waiting to add things in. <laughs> oh, go for it then. What do, do you have any yeah, other so, extra things? I, I mean, of course, I completely agree with it. Like, if we're mm -hmm. talking about the UA purpose, it's uh, provided the relatively thinner margin on hyper casual titles. It might not make sense. Uh, but I do see that just personally, uh, uh, I do see uh, good cases in the market, like a hyper casual publisher, um, they run viral TikTok accounts, not around a single title, but around a character. So once this becomes viral, basically it sets the foundation that they could use the same character to continue with other titles or with even heavier hybrid ones. So I think that's a pretty mm. smart idea. <laughs> That is, yeah, having kind of like a mascot for your company and then using the mascot to promote. We we like yeah. we do have a mascot ourselves, and I like to use them to promote our videos. So it's actually a very good, uh, a very good uh, marketing strategy. But let's go back to you, Yolanda. Let's talk about bad. What are some of the thing, mis typical mistakes that you see that some people take uh, when they're <laughs> building? their marketing that takes them on uh, the wrong the wrong journey up that mm -hmm. mountain of uh, the best marketing. Right, so um, <clears throat> we do we do have, uh, well, I mean, I can't say, you know, it's not correct to say that we make mistakes in those things. Uh, but, uh, you know, from time to time, we have clients saying, okay, can you help us take a look at our account and see why we can't achieve the same result with yours? Right. Even some clients would run parallel and compare the results and see why are you achieving better than us. So usually, what we are seeing, especially for new, for less known platforms, um, it's uh, either that the 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 deeper in ones are not being properly uh, tracked and optimized. That's actually the killer, uh, mm. or it's the lack of uh, it's the ad fit basically. So they are not updating the creators soon enough. So we can see that, uh, uh, so the, the best practice, what we usually recommend to our clients, for example, for social media, yeah, especially TikTok, where ads saturate super fast, it needs to be at least five to eight sets of creatives per week uh, for minimum budget, for basically just the budget you want to make this campaign learning work. If you increase your budget with scaling and everything, we actually recommend you getting higher uh, amount of creatives. So uh, that's the amount of creators and the iteration. And then there could be also that um, uh, it's an old style of creative that uh, you're just trying to make a sales pitch. You're not really following. It's not really following the the the, the trend, basically. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, and then it could be the rhythm as well uh, that. Uh, uh, if you create the eye-catching moment, the conflicts already in the first three seconds or five seconds, depending on the region you are talking about. Um, if you are already giving the full story background within the first 10 to 15 seconds and then continue with uh, what you really want to want to pitch, right? And then uh, there are different ways of pitching as well. The usual mistake, um, uh, we see a lot around localization and culturalization. So my European clients, for example, they want to increase their presence in Japan, let's say. And, um, um, you know, you, you can't just say, okay, uh, we find the, the, the local actor, local UG, uh, like lo local actor to repeat the same kind of um, uh, a storyline would work. It doesn't. So they are different, tiny differences. How uh, uh what, what kind of benefits really motivate the user to download in certain cultures so those are all the common mistakes that we see hmm. vlad okay well that, that that's a lot of stuff i'm sorry vlad it's it's what about you i'm, I'm guessing uh there's something she missed <laughs> um I, I don't think she missed something i think it was a good micro perspective. I, I would rather answer it from a more macro perspective where i, I would say like um 
as I already mentioned, I think the most important mistake that you can make is that you're not building your own tech stack from the beginning, but you rather rely on third parties dependency and this sum up, sum up all the time. When then you when you break it down by conversion to the end of the month that you are basically less able to pay more because you have those dependency. Um, then on the other side, I would also say this fear of failure, which you can create within the company or within the team, that no one is willing to take risks. And then that means that there's no progress. Like it's, you have to, in some cases, overspend. You have to test something. It, it will fail, right. but that's only how you can succeed. And then and on a side note also, I think it's important when you guess what would you advise to when you're joining the market, when you want to go in, it's like not thinking big. So you want to become number one. Like if you're joining the market, your target is not to like just copy the number one and hope to be the number two, basically. But you have to like think big and like, what do I need to do to be the best in this area where I'm joining, basically. Hmm. Wow. <laughs> Rouge, I don't know if there's anything else you could add. I, they, they pretty much have gotten a lot of. They've talked about yeah, no. the product side and the company side. <laughs> Is there anything else? Uh, yeah, I pretty much agree with them both. But also, uh, yeah, you you have to see like the campaigns are usually not optimized correctly. The target audience is not set rightly. Uh, sometimes like the marketers just go like, you know, in the target audience, they're like male, female, all locations done. The ad is gone. <laughs> and that, that doesn't work out in the end. Uh, also, you, you have, uh, like Yolanda said, that you have to have a set of creatives that you can rapidly test out. And uh, you 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 always have to be you know willing to take risks because sometimes we we don't see the results immediately and uh, there, there's usually an optimum uh, timeline uh, or the number of days that you have to do the test with. So like if you shut your campaign within uh, two hours of uh, just running it that the CPI is higher, it's not going to work for you. You have to run it for an optimum number of hours. Or, or I would say days, because usually it's days. You know, you, you don't get the results in just a few hours. The campaign takes uh, time to learn and optimize itself. So like uh, give it optimum time and budget also, because you, you cannot, uh, you know, set a $10 campaign and expect to get a, a good result out of it. The Usually uh, like people, uh, especially the newer devs in the industry, they are not setting optimum budgets or the optimum target audiences or giving it uh, the time it needs to optimize itself. And that's why their uh, results are not usually good. So, OK. So from what I'm hearing from you guys is that you need to have uh, veins of steel and uh, a patience of, a, of, a, of an owl, I guess, or something like that. <laughs> you got to be very patient and just uh, be bold and uh, stay true. I think that's going to be, I think with a lot of the marketing, it, with so much competition we have, you have to be because uh, we have so many, there are so many companies and there's so many opportunities for people to want to become the next big uh, game. Um, so the, I'm looking at the questions I have and I'm not sure if any of these are really that great. <laughs> I did this during my COVID days, so I'm not quite sure if all of them are correctly going to work out. Uh, so, oh, I have, I do have one because you were talking about uh, advertisements. You said to have uh, Yolanda. You said about five or six. How long? Uh, you want them per week, right? A new five or six new ones every week. That's right. Is, yes, five to eight usually. That's our average. What we are supporting the client with. Yes. Is do you feel that there's uh, some clients are just feeling that that's just too much, or they feel like it's just uh, overwhelming? Well, I mean, if they try to handle it in-house, it might be too much. Um, but it really, this is something that really makes keep the, 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 the uh, performance up. So I can share with you, I'm actually pulling out right now, my back end. So for this campaign, yeah, when it runs, um, so for this specific campaign, when it runs, the, the creative is at a multi optimal level. It usually drives the CPR of 8.37%, CVR of 21%. This is what I see in the platform. And another one, which died out already, the latest data would be CPR 1.7% and CVR 9%. So it's a huge difference, you see, if you, if you multiply the, the data. Um, mm. So depending on the platform, I mean, of course, with SDK networks, you don't have to keep updating your creators all the time. But if it's TikTok we are talking about, people get, it, it gets saturated. 
So the mm. engagement goes down. We don't want to see that. Right. So, okay. So you're saying <laughs> that once it starts to get uh, below 8%, it's time to start looking into maybe putting in the next installment of, uh, of creatives, correct? I wouldn't give an absolute number. It, needs de <laughs> it depends on the geo, the genre, uh, the okay. seasonality we're running, but we always have some benchmark there. You know how your game is usually running, right? But right. once things go wrong, you know it's going wrong. So it's always about benchmarks. It's just making sure you're hitting your benchmarks. I would say so, so yes. OK. Yeah, somebody that, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm kind of the odd one out. I'm the one who's only doing B2B. So for me, this is actually interesting to, to learn a little bit more from the B2C groups. Um, I'm trying to think, uh, Aruj, uh, is there, what do you do as a small group uh, compared to like something, I know like Yolanda's with NativeX, which is a pretty, one of the top uh, creative development companies. I mean, what do you do as one of the smaller ones? You just put your head down and, push forward is, is I, I feel that's maybe a little bit a little uh, bit embarrassing we try. Yeah. <laughs> I would say we, we try we try our best to do as much as we can but obviously we have limitations uh and sometimes when we feel necessary we do partner up with some people hmm. or, or you know or try to go with a publishing partner so that they can handle things better for us uh, yes. Like, uh, you know, with our previous game, uh, you know, Explotance, like it, it was uh, published with Apple Arcade. So they handled all the marketing and stuff for us. So we didn't have to worry that much about all this. So, like we had a good team at, at our back who could help us. Mm. So uh, I, I, I would say like with, without proper support, it, it can be very overwhelming and tough uh, for, for especially for single dev is trying to do it everything by himself. And uh, usually you ne also need like a big budget like small smaller budgets are kind of tough to deal with it especially in in, in this category it, do you agree with that lad i see you're shaking your head yeah i definitely agree because if you have if you have a small budget the outcome of impressions that you will have per creative is so low that you cannot statistically prove the difference in like any of those kpis like if you want to have one percent see a uh, click through in, uh, click to install rate difference you need to at least i don't know 50k of impressions to statistically prove that it's correct that the difference is there um but yeah in gen generally speaking i also agree with Yolanda that you need a lot of creatives um to test them like you you have your base level you need to know what is a good performing creative and then you need to notice when is the creative fatigue is coming in so i did see that sometimes you have a christmas creative still running in april and performing quite well uh, so as long as this is the case why why removing it um but then if you notice that the ipm is actually dropping or the conversion cti whatever you want to measure um, then it's time to bring something new in. It can be also on a weekly basis. And as we were speaking before, I think even the, like if you, if you have a small amount of people in the creative team, like changing the background from green to blue, if you know that this creative works, can already do the trick. So it's a new it's a, it's a new data point for the algorithm to learn. Hey, this might be a good performer, and then it might get all the impressions suddenly. Mm. So oh, I had a question that I lost. Uh, we're, we're, we're getting down to the last five minutes. And so I'd like to do uh, a little game I like to play when uh, we're getting uh, close to time and we've gone through most of the questions I had is let's ask your other people in your in this group. So what I'd like to do is uh, Vlad, Rouge, and Yolanda, go ahead and think about a question that you would like to ask the other two people in this group uh, about uh, that you would like to know more about or you think that the uh, other people would like to know. Um, I'll ask uh, Yolanda, do you have a question you wanted to ask Aruj and Vlad? Hmm. Yeah, I have a million questions. I need to think about it. Give me one more minute. <laughs> okay, I'll give you a Okay, who, uh, Vlad, do you, have a, do you know of a good question you want to ask Aruj and Yolanda? I'm sure, Aruj. Um, so you move from the hyper casual game industry to the more casual game or Steam game. What do you see is the biggest difference on the product side and then also on the marketing side when it comes to like tackling the game itself? Um, yeah, uh, because like in hyper casual, we, we could usually uh, drive the downloads with ads and stuff, but moving towards like more uh, mainstream uh, gaming industry, you, you actually have to grab the audience intention to your product. And most of the uh, marketing turns into kind of branding. Uh, you you are focusing le less on advertising and more uh, you know building towards your brand value, 
uh, and ga gaining wish lists. So uh, it's another type of challenge. Uh, and uh, also, uh, if you are lucky, you're working with uh, you know big AAA companies. They have huge marketing budgets. You're making cinematic trailers and whatnot. And on the other hand, when you are working with indies, uh, they hardly have budget to develop the game itself, <laughs> and usually are looking for funding to do for the game development. Uh, so uh, the marketing teams right there are always like, give, give us some kind of budget, at least ten dollars, twenty dollars. <laughs> so there, there we usually have to rely on our own organic marketing skills to to build the audience, especially with the indie devs. Yeah, I, uh, it's very fun to watch uh, the different groups because I'm in a lot of different Discord groups and it's fun to watch the marketing groups from the PC side talking about all the problems and the issues they have on the PC side and then go over to the mobile groups and then see all the issues they have with uh, all the stuff that we're talking about today. It's just, it's a, it's a very fascinating uh, how different uh, focused each group is in their marketing standards. Uh, Yolanda, did you figure out your question yet, or? Yes, yes, I can ask now. Since Ruch, you already have a question, then I'm going to direct my question to Vlad. Um, I remember seeing a blog post from Sunday, like a couple of months ago, saying that the market is transiting towards hybrid cash flow, but we decide to stay with hyper cash flow. Uh, could you share a little bit, um, you know, the thought process and maybe, um, you, you know, because I personally, I. I totally agree that there's no single solution towards the, all the market challenges. And um, um, yeah, I think maybe the audience wants to know as well what is uh, convincing now with hyper <laughs> Um Yeah, I, I think it just sounds like an easy escape. So yeah, there is a trap like the market and, and the ECPMs are dropping over this year, right? We all know it um, and the reasons for it. And I think it's just, too, too easy to say, okay, this market doesn't work. We, we are now making casual games. And, and also, it, it sounds like the casual market is not competitive at all. Like, we just joined the casual market and we're going to succeed there. Um, instead of doing that, and also this would bring a lot of new challenges and a lot of, lot of new requirements, um, we rather tend to, okay, let's see what is the core of the hyper-casual market. Where can we improve? What, what, is the mar what does the market need currently? And how can we fill this position and that's why we changed our ideation process that's why we changed the approach of creating the games and as i was mentioning in the beginning like the market changed like it's not enough to make a fun looking creative for the first and then one day retention rate and that's it and then you have the money but you really need to dive deep into how should the game look like how should creative look like how do you deal with the users like how do you segment the users how do you monetize the users in different ways instead of just hey here's an interstitial here's another interstitial <laughs> money <laughs> no you need you need to uh, work on smart ways to Im improve uh, your rewarded ads how do you want the users how do you keep the users entertained and that's what we are trying to do i think you're muted look 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 <laughs> i am muted sorry uh by the way if you guys want to know more about monetization i am going to be uh uh, in the monetization group uh, in a couple of, I think in uh, two, in another hour, we'll have a monetization discussion with me and we'll talk a little bit more about some good quality stuff there. Um, but Rouge, do you have a question for either Yolando or Vlad or both? Yeah, I would like to ask both of them. Like, you know, recently we see that the mobile started, uh, market usually started with endless runners going to hyper casual. These days there's a trend of 3D uh, hyper casual game. So what, what do you see that would be the most trending thing in the coming days? Like, do, do you have any personal guesses or a trend that you're looking forward to? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> there are just so, so many, like, like the, the way yeah, there are some companies, they are right, just really good, for example, in making runner games and you cannot take it away from them. It's like, they will also succeed also in making, keep making runner games. I assume so. Um, but if you look closer into the market, you, there, there are definitely like trends that you can see that the users are playing more like, I don't know, FPS, for example, is decreasing rather than uh, crowd games are becoming better. Or recently we were focusing on aiming puzzles that, because we noticed that aiming puzzle market, the last big game was published like more than one and a half years ago, but it still is considered, I think I would say as a cash cow. It brings the um, downloads and I assume it also brings the margin. And that's what we're aiming for. So we aim for like what what we don't aim to 
hit the top chart one time and then drop again and say, hey, did this a hit game? But we would rather like to have games that are producing for us margin and also for the developers. And that's why, yeah, you need to check, analyze the market in a way like what is long term performing. And there we have, I would say, aiming puzzle was looking good, crowd control, something like that. Hmm. Yolanda, any trends? Um, about talking about games and um, um, no, I, I I prefer because um, you know I I we, we we sort of know the 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 kind of the insights from our clients what that they're planning to launch in Q1 and all those things. So I prefer to skip the question. <laughs> yeah, so I will, I say it sounds like <laughs> I will say from the country that uh, loves to uh, make their make big hits in casual and hyper casual here in China. I'm living in China, for those who don't know. Uh, there is a trend of extreme difficulty games where they'll introduce you the game very simple, but then there, there'll be a very high difficulty level in how many people can complete a level. And then having that kind of uh, fight between other people. Uh, one game that's become super popular is, Sheep, is called Sheep is Sheep, which is a uh, Mahjong game where you collect three. Yes, Yolanda probably knows this game. Mm -hmm. uh, built with our uh, with our game engine, uh, but you collect uh, three different mahjong tiles. But the problem is, is they're so hidden inside each other. It, it multiple people will lose multiple times. I think I played it for three months and only won one game. So Whoa. that's how different. And that kind of game has become we became a huge hit uh, during the summer and, and fall of China. So. Um, that's something I will give a, a, as a uh, tip for you guys. Try something with extreme extreme difficulty, but with huge rewards. That seems to be a, a big thing going on in China currently. So, uh, But I think that is it. We are done with this uh, event. We want to thank everybody here for coming on. I want to thank uh, Vlad and Nuruj and Yolanda for coming and uh, sharing what they have to say about marketing. I hope all of you learned a lot about marketing and this will help you to get moving forward. And if not, you can always uh, contact most of these people I saw on LinkedIn. And so they're always great. To, you'll be able to talk to them if you want. I hope you guys will accept some invites and I hope that everybody here will have a great time and uh, make a lot of good money in the future. So uh, that's it for this time. And uh, we'll see you guys on the next conference talk. Bye.